Good evening, everyone. And uh, you got a little precursor to um, each of the great presentations you'll get to see tonight. And um, the very last one that you saw, um, Canopy, is actually part of our Pitch Club extension. So they have done a recorded video of their presentation. Um, but we are very fortunate that Joe from Canopy will be here tonight um, in a post networking session. So you can certainly talk to him and learn more about their product and their company. Um, so I do want to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for taking time on this Tuesday evening to come and hear about the great innovation that these three companies um, have to share with us. And um, just a little background. So um, Pitch Club is actually an event. Really, our goal is to engage our clinician um, and investment members with our um, startup companies. And really, the idea is to get um, exposure for these companies, provide education opportunities around the entrepreneurial experience, um, but also to be able to get feedback for them. Um, and so the ways that you are able to provide feedback to these companies is first through your questions, um, following each of their presentations, and then second is through a poll. So we have some general questions and then each company has provided us with a specific question that they would love to get your feedback on. So um, we will have times throughout the event tonight for you to be able to um, fill out the polls and provide the feedback to these companies. So we do ask that you take a minute to do that. The other thing, so we will have the three presentations tonight. Following this, we actually do have um, networking opportunities. There are tables for each of these companies. And as I said, also for Canopy, we will also have a table that I'll be hosting um, for our clinical advisory board. So for clinicians who would like to learn a little bit more about the Angel MD Clinical Advisory Board, um, you can pop in and I'll be more than happy to uh, tell you more about that. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Katie Richardson, who is our um, VP of Clinical Relations and our amazing MC for the evening. Thanks, Jennifer. Welcome everyone. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we have three great companies here tonight, as well as I think a very interesting company for our Pitch Club extension video. So we're super excited. And without um, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce our first speaker. So we have Dr. Norman Paradis, founder and CEO of CPR Therapeutics. Norman, go ahead and um, share your screen. We look forward to hearing all about an innovation in CPR, which my understanding is something like this hasn't come along for a very, very long time. Well, thank you, uh, Katie. Thank you very much. I, I'm honored to be presenting uh, to such a renowned um, angel group. Michael and Katie didn't want me to do this, but I'm going to thank them anyway. They've given me some excellent uh, coaching uh, in the last uh, day or two. This is a healthcare audience, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, dwelling on the fact that sudden cardiac uh, arrest is the leading killer in Western countries, and that unlike on television, the outcomes are generally poor with survival less than 10%. I would like to highlight uh, just a single factoid, which is that a 10% improvement in the outcomes of patients suffering sudden death would save more lives than any single agent in oncology. The reason for the bad outcomes is well known. Uh, if you look to the left, you'll see that uh, the blood flows with ideal CPR, this is laboratory CPR, are only a fraction of normal. Uh, when uh, EMS personnel are doing manual in the field, uh, their uh, flows are even less than this. Uh, the two current most commonly used devices, the auto pulse from Zoll and the Lucas from Stryker, do not have better blood flows than manual, and they both failed their uh, clinical trials. A uh, potential solution has been obvious for some time. If you look to the left, you can see that uh, greater force and greater depth of CPR is associated with better outcomes. But there's no way to achieve that with the current approaches. If you look to the right, 
you see the skeletal fractures and visceral organ injuries from manual CPR, the auto pulse, and the Lucas. They're already in the range of 60 to 80 percent of all patients. If you tried to put in more force, you would just do tremendous damage. Um, almost 30 years ago, uh, we uh, spent $16 million of the NIH funds developing circumferential vest CPR. That's the blue band you're seeing in this um, image. This uh, approach by spreading the force around the chest allows us to double or triple the amount of motive force um, without doing any um, damage. Unfortunately, um, 20 or 30 years ago, the state of pneumatics and batteries uh, were such that um, the device did not get uh, commercialized. We continued to enhance it by adding abdominal counterpulsation in green, sternal selective in red, and, and the uh, synchronization of the electrical uh, therapies, which you can't see in this uh, image. Um, as you heard in a little uh, bit of video earlier, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. If you look to the left, you can see the blood flows in a pig model of cardiac arrest. Uh, the yellow is CPRT multimodal CPR, and the other bars are uh, pig equivalents of the autopulse, the Lucas, and manual. Uh, these numbers looked almost too good to be true, so I've included on the right actual raw data out of the pig model. And uh, you probably don't need me to point out the segments of multimodal CPR. The blood flows are dramatically uh, better. Uh, in reviewing our history, uh, it's a bit longer than most startups. If you look, you'll see the uh, 16 million in NIH funding in the 90s, and then the failure of that company because of the pneumatics and the battery. You then see our continuing innovation in uh, multimodal uh, CPR. And I want to highlight one or two other things, which is that uh, the startup was uh, started with a seed grant from Zoll Medical, the premier strategic uh, in this space, and then 350000 in angel funds. Um, we have a very strong IP uh, position. Uh, we uh, filed multiple patents on multimodal CPR and all its um, combinations. Um, of particular importance for some investors, uh, and so I'd like to highlight it, is that we're going to do a stage 510K series to get to multimodal. And the first step is a 510K of just the old vest as a cath lab device. We plan to do that in the next 15 months so that the company goes from developmental to uh, commercial relatively um, quickly. Uh, here is our team. Uh, briefly, everyone in the field of um, resuscitation medicine knew that because of our first mover advantage and all of the patents, we were gonna have the only opportunity at better CPR in this decade. And so we had our pick of, uh, of uh, founders. And I personally think this is the team that you would have um, put together if you could choose anyone. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity, Michael and Katie. I'm really appreciative and look forward to any questions. Great. For those of you that are in our audience, um, please put any questions you have for Norman and CPR Therapeutics in the Q&A. That's just to the right of the chat if you haven't been on this AirMeet platform before. But I'm going to start with a couple of my own questions. Um, if we if we think about your timeline or, or just in looking at your timeline, it looks like this technology has been around for a while. So why has it taken so long to get to market? Yeah, Katie, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, this was the first device that Johns Hopkins ever out licensed. And when you license something out, you kind of give up your baby a little bit. And we didn't necessarily agree that the state of pneumatics and batteries was so poor in 1990 that it wasn't worth proceeding to commercializations. But the investors at the time did. And so they stopped uh, proceeding. Very good. Um, and one of my just uh, 
clinical question. How hard is this to apply during an emergency? I mean, if this is really circumferential on the patient, it seems like it might be um, difficult when, of course, you're stressed and trying to move quickly. Yeah, another really good question. There's no, there's no avoiding the fact that a device will always involve some interruption. Even though the CPRT device is multimodal and has a lot of high tech in it, to the providers, it looks like a giant blood pressure cuff. So you put it next to the patient, lift them up and roll them on and then close it. In simulations in the lab, people with just a bit of training can uniformly put it on in under 20 seconds. And it's so simple that we actually think someday down the road, an airport AED-like version could be developed for health clubs and things. Um, it, it goes on as easily as a device can go on. Nothing will ever beat hands. We won't beat that for time. We'll just beat it for blood flows. Great. Um, and actually, that leads into one of our audience questions. Um, talk a little bit more about your go-to-market strategy and distribution plan. And specifically, Dr. Rothstein asked, um, what is the plan for pre-hospital distribution of this device? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Rothstein. To get into EMS, you are, you are going to have to get a level one recommendation from the American Heart predicated on a definitive clinical trial. So we know we're, we're 36 to 48 months away from that. And that's the reason we're going to go first with the in-hospital uh, VEST application as a way to market. Uh, we've actually gotten pull out of uh, interventional cardiology because the current devices interfere with imaging. And so every time there's a cardiac arrest in the cath lab, it's kind of a cluster where someone has to get up on the table and do CPR in the beam because the current devices interfere. This is, the vest is completely radiolucent. So that's our pathway to commercialization in the near term. Very good. And talk another clinically relevant question. Um, we saw you talk about the failure of some of these competitors out there and um, the amazing data, at least in your pig studies, which is awesome. But tell us why your device doesn't cause the thoracic damage, um, but it's able to provide sufficient force. Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. And so I've come up with a little analogy about circumferential. If you take an egg and try and break it by squeezing it evenly all around, uh, it's much more difficult. And so circumferential is analogous to trying to break an egg by squeezing it everywhere. Very good. All right. Um, one last question for you tonight. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your planned in-human studies? Because I would imagine um, if your device really can do what it says it can do, uh, comparing it to standard of care is probably not what we would want to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're hopeful in the near term, Katie. Um, we took the vest all the way to a New England Journal paper in the 90s uh, with about 70 or 80 patients. So we think that because it's intrinsically safer and at least equally effective, we think that the FDA will give us a 510K clearance either with no additional clinical data or just an early feasibility study in 15 or 20 patients. That's the good news. The bad news is that, um, and the bad news has a flip side to it, uh, which is that eventually you, you have to do an RTC. You have to do it under exemption from consent and you have to improve outcomes. Right. Now, what I like to tell people is that's a lot of pain. But if you think about it, a device that improves outcome in that setting isn't a discretionary purchase in emergency medicine or EMS. So there is a reward for all of that difficulty, but it, I don't wanna say that it's it's gonna be an easy road for us. Yeah, I think this is gonna be the, the must have device for every EMS, emergency room, hospital, et cetera. I said last question, but I think there's a fairly easy one um, that came from our audience as well. Um, do you have information on how much this costs? How much is the device gonna cost? 
Yeah, we've spent a fair amount of time talking to EMS and emergency physicians about this. And we know from the engineers what the cost of goods sold will be. The two current devices sell for about $17,000. We think we can get this device uh, into the hands of clinicians for something like twenty two to 24000 All right. Well, Norman, thank you so much for being here tonight. This is really exciting. I mean, clearly, if we can save more lives um, using CPR, we want to do it, right? Thanks, Katie. And again, thanks for the coaching the last few days. <laughs> You're very welcome. We're happy to have you. All right. We're going to move right on to our second company of the evening. I love all the emojis. Yes, CPR Therapeutics and Norman did a great job. But we're going to move on to our second company of the evening. So I have tonight with us Dr. Stephen Pierce, and he is the CEO of a company called EM Tensor. Okay, and and thanks again for you to to you, Michael, for the help that you provided. This is a, a vastly improved presentation compared to what it was before. Um, so I'm the CEO of EM Tensor, and we're in the business of uh, accelerating brain injury treatment. We hope to save millions from death or disability and avoid much of the $1 trillion uh, bill per year in global ongoing disabled care costs. Globally, affecting 17 million people per year, stroke is the leading cause of disability and the second leading cause of death. You heard about the first leading cause uh, during the last presentation. Early stroke determination dramatically improves outcomes using existing medical therapies. Yep, everyone that's needed is already in, in existence. Typical times to treatment in the past best case of cities remain about four hours because the patient must travel to obtain a confirmatory image in a hospital CT or MRI. Reducing the time to treatment to under the golden hour could eliminate disability from 100 million stroke victims in the coming decade and save the lives of more than 2 million others per year. Accelerating time to treatment for all stroke patients from four or more hours to minutes can turn back time on disability and death. Our portable brain imager moves the confirmatory image to within minutes of onset, even as far as pre-ambulance, providing stroke type, size, position, and severity sufficiently well to support treatment much earlier than is currently even a dream. Emma is a compact and mobile 3D functional brain imager. Emma is safe using orders of magnitude less power than the safety limits of a cell phone and no ionizing radiation. She is non-invasive and requires no contrast agents. Emma is fast, enabling initial stroke diagnosis and later monitoring between confirmatory images. Emma is orders of magnitude less expensive than current imaging gold standards. In an exploratory clinical trial, Emma was 100% sensitive and 97% specific against the all-important hemorrhagic exclusion claim. Emma detects hemorrhage as small as 0.13 milliliters or roughly five millimeters across. CT for hemorrhagic exclusion is estimated at best around 80% sensitive for such a small hemorrhage. Emma can directly color unhealthy tissue. Emma's base technology can be extended to other pathologies such as traumatic brain injury and other areas of the body. Time sensitive neurological injury is merely Emma's first target. Emma's intelligence is a colossal multi-computer hosted in the cloud, remoted via the cell phone network. Only Emma's head is physical a cylinder with 128 transceivers that measures bioelectromagnetic disturbance, which converts to a 3D relative permittivity. Emma's technological breakthrough reduces the astronomical processing time of a full wave bioelectromagnetic tomographer from millennia to a few minutes. Simply unfeasible before today and without numerous M10s of proprietary optimizations to the physics, materials, mathematics, and software to process and mapping, Emma's ability to color hemorrhage red and ischemic tissue blue in a DICOM image is a good bet. On the left is a CT uh, of a hemorrhagic example taken from our exploratory clinical trial. I'll put up a little laser pointer so I can move around and show that a little bit better. So what we're talking about is in this region here. Let's see, yeah, this region here and here. This bright spot is hemor hemorrhage. Um, on the right, we have the M10s of brain image, and the red spot there is where we've colored our suspected hemorrhage. In the middle bottom is a histogram of that red area compared to the gray bars would be the exact same area on the other side of the brain. What we notice is that there's a dramatic move to higher relative permittivity. Now, to give you some idea, blood is a higher relative permittivity compared to 
um, white and gray matter. That's why it would move that way. Um, then in the bottom left, we do a hist basically a scatter plot of that same relative permittivity in the real imaginary parts taken from our image. And we put them on this scatter plot. And what we notice is it's basically a peak right around blood. That is a classic characteristic of a hemorrhage in our image of modality. So we're able to point that out within, it takes about 0.4 of a second to capture the data and two, two minutes to make it available. And we can directly uh, point the uh, physician's attention to that red region rather than having them slide through many, many slices in a dichrome image. So, next slide. On the left, in this case, is an MRI image for an ischemic patient uh, taken within a couple of hours of on onset. So this bright green area is an ischemia in the diffusion uh, image. Uh, similarly, there's a little bit of a uh, bright spot in this diffusion image. That's an infarct, a little bit of dead tissue. Um, and this patient was thrombolized at two and a half hours. So on the right here, we see an image of nine hours where we still see the evidence of the ischemia. It hasn't quite cleared up yet. Um, and we color it in blue. Then we do a histogram down the bottom here, and we can play the blue areas on this image uh, in blue bars to the gray areas, which is the exact same region on the other side of the brain. And again, what we see with an ischemia is that it dramatically moves the relative permittivity to lower relative permittivity. It's basically the blood has been removed. So it, it turns white or gray matter into something that is kind of below the relative permittivity of white or gray, or white or gray matter down here in the bottom corner in this scatter plot. So all ischemias have this characteristic that we did 43 ischemias and nine hemorrhages uh, to, and every, every single one behaved in this way. So MS basically snapshots and provides an image within a few minutes, whereas an MRI, this particular MRI would take more than 45 minutes just to acquire the data, let alone uh, in, you know, set the patient up for the appropriate uh, IV to be able to inject the contrast agent. All the while, during that 45 minutes, the, brain, the patient's brain is dying. This is the same patient. Now you notice at 28 hours, um, his ischemia is cleared up. He's still got a slightly worse infarct. On our image, the ischemia is cleared up on the right here. Still a few blue bars, but it's not an excursion right down to the bottom lower relative permittivity. So it's like some of the problem is still there and some isn't. And you see it on the scatter plot. You've taken that region that was all the way to the left of the white and gray matter, and some of it has moved back into the white matter region. So even some of the blue in this particular image is actually recovered tissue. Okay, so uh, founded in 2012, M10 has 23 issued patents and more than 22 pending. It's based on 20 years of research described in more than 40 co-founded publications. Blood concentration has been connected to relative permittivity. Um, we, we proved that through, and it's almost instantaneous. If you uh, close off a pig's um, artery, you'll, you'll see it immediately. Um, research was funded by grants from Carolina's healthcare system, USNIH and Austrian FFG. Our human clinical trial involved 52 patients uh, and published in 2021 at ESOC in Helsinki. Our intention is to accelerate productization of EMMA and multi-center clinical trials in 2022 and every subsequent year. You see lots of patients in there in trials, lots of new units and lots of FDA, FDA approvals. Our team has three Key elements, stellar guidance from a world-renowned advisory team, including physicians, medtech regulatory and healthcare leaders, a powerhouse problem-solving uh, team of seven Austrian PhDs, and leadership with astonishing growth track records, including engineering, program management from major strategics, marketing and sales and business development from healthcare. Together, this team has driven Emma's efficiency, mobility, and accuracy to astounding vision, physician excitement over the last year or so. Great, Stephen, thank you so much for presenting. Um, it's great to learn more about EM Tensor. This is really interesting technology to me, of, of which um, I think I, I look at it and I, you know, so much of the, um, what do I want to say? The physics of it all is, you know, something that probably I never learned, I'm guessing. But tell us why others haven't done this before. They've tried. Um, most of the major strategics have tried, and they tried about a decade ago. And they failed for a variety of reasons. But it's basically because if you try with currently available technology, 
you would conclude that it would take a millennia to process the data to get to the images that we produce. So what we've managed to do is change the physics, the materials, the way the mapping does onto processors, and we've leveraged this enormous, to give you some idea, the computer that we use, the best graphics processing unit on planet Earth is an NVIDIA A100. It is 5,000 processors, whereas you might have, I think you've got 30 in your phone, right? And we use 200 of them. That wasn't even, even dreamt of even a decade ago. That's an absolutely ludicrous amount of processing. But it requires that to solve the bioelectromagnetic problem in the kind of detail that we need. So everybody said it's impossible. And we said, eh, might be possible in the future. Well, we can do it. That's what you said. And then yeah. you did it. Yeah. All we right. were at hours, even a year ago. So, you know, we're at now at two minutes. That's awesome. We have a lot of great clinical questions um, mm -hmm. from our audience. So I'm going to move on to those. Um, the first is a couple about um, where is this going to be used? Is the idea that this is used at the bedside in the ER? Is this used mm -hmm. in the field? Is it used in the patient's home by EMS? Talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that. That's a great question. So there are four key areas. And we'll start with the stroke ICU. And we'll start with the notion that you can use it to just monitor the patient and protect them from the complications that occur and actually kill a lot of patients in the hospital. Right? And the reason for doing that there is that stroke physicians will give us a thumbs up and they'll infect the rest of the world. The very next place we use it is in the ER. And we help the ER decide which patients need to go for a confirmatory image, CT or MRI, which patients need to go home. And we weed out the ones that are real strokes from the ones that are mimics. Big, big benefit, huge problem, especially in the winter, I was hearing in Stanford. Sure. Uh, then the next one is where it really rubber meets the road and it turn, changes the world, right? We can deploy this thing because it weighs 50 pounds. You can pick it up. You can take it with you from an ambulance, just like you do with an EKG right now and you can use it at onset with the patient before you ever put them in the ambulance. We've talked to EMTs about this, they love it. It's exactly the equivalent of the EKG they take for sudden cardiac arrest or cardiac issues in general. Uh, they can very quickly figure out which kind of stroke it is, take the patient to the right hospital. If they need a thrombectomy, go there. If they have a hemorrhage, go to the nearest one. If they have a small vessel occlusion, go to one that can handle that. Um, they can also potentially, if we prove this, we're already better than CT and being able to be sensitive to hemorrhagic exclusion. That means that it could become, in the not too distant future, a reason for justifying the application of TPA, the clot busting drug. And that would make a dramatic difference to so many people's lives. It's already been proven that if you deliver a CT based ambulance to the, to the onset, you, you save 25% more lives and you drop, halve the figures for all of the disability metrics. In fact, it's been suggested that you get two and a half times more zero outcome strokes than if you don't do. That's and the last place, the last place is in the diagnostic center where it might serve a whole slew of different uh, blood related uh, issues uh, over time. But we have a little bit less information on that one. All right, that's fantastic. A couple more clinical questions because um, I love those. So how, good as it at identifying old blood versus new blood so do we have any information on sensitivity and specificity related to that uh -huh. and then the accuracy and or sensitivity for um detecting microbleeds is another question yeah so the microbleeds was actually that specific 100 percent and 97 percent because we saw even in our clinical trial a five well actually several five millimeter um hemorrhages, which are, which are basically where you sort of kind of define as a microbleed. Things above that are bigger than that, but microbleeds are down to five millimeters. And um, many of the physicians they work with actually want to separate microbleeds from non-microbleeds because they want to not give patients TPA in the non-microbleed case, but they do still want to give them TPA in the microbleed case because it's actually not a good enough reason to withhold it. That's been proven. There's a 570 person study uh, done in Europe on that, and it's maybe a 2% difference. So it's really not a good thing to, you know, stop a patient from getting TPA on the basis of that. And the um, other so that, question... So that's, oh, go, go ahead. So it's, why don't you repeat that? Because I think it was a two-part question. It was. Sure. So the other question was um, the ability to detect old blood versus new blood. That's a very good question as well. We think 
that we can see the, in the same way as an MRI, it changes over time as blood ages. We can see that in the relative permittivity. Now, it doesn't show up in the real part of the relative permittivity. It shows up in the imaginary part, which is actually arguably more sensitive, but it's also more non-anatomical. People look at those and they go, that doesn't look like anything like a brain, <laughs> but it's, it's real for the physics of the situation. So we have to do a lot more patient studies to actually make an association. But what we're doing right now is we're basically registering MRI and CT and then comparing our results to those so that anything that can be seen in any of those other modalities, we can set as a goal for our recognition algorithms to say, okay, can we see that with any kind of um, sensitivity and specificity? So it's over time, as we have more cases, we'll be able to answer that kind of question. It's just sure. with 52 right now, it's just enough to say, hey, this is very promising. It's not enough to say, I can prove that's infarct because it's this, or I can prove it's old blood because of that. Yeah. Hugely important question, because if you yes. tell the age, you can, make, you can make a big difference to, okay, do I treat or do I not treat? Of do course. I do yeah. Well, Stephen, there are several more questions in the chat, and I hope all of you will stick around for our um, post-event networking because Stephen will be there to answer the rest of your questions. Thank you so much for being here tonight and telling us all about EM Tensor. This seems like really exciting technology that could be used in many, many different circumstances and indications, I'm guessing. So thank you for being here. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that there is um, the polls and our polls are meant to give feedback to our CEOs, our founders. These companies want your feedback. They want to know um, what you think about their product and they have contributed to these questions. And so they, they want to know the answer to um, that final question as well. Uh, and having this group of clearly highly engaged clinicians uh, and others makes it very exciting for them to um, want the data back from these polls. So please take a moment and fill those out. So Thomas Swan is the director of business development for a company called Retrieve Medical. And if you were on a little bit early tonight, what, what you would know is that Retrieve Medical was one of the four finalists for the ASEP 2020 Innovation Awards. So Tom, looking forward to hearing all about Retrieve Medical. So my name is Tom Swan. I'm, it's an exciting time for Retrieve uh, Medical, and I'm you know, looking forward to presenting our uh, software. It's called Retrieve DX. So what are the major deficiencies with electronic medical records? It's the difficulty to document. So EMRs have become a waste of time. Sitting down at the end of a long shift, eight to 10 hours to document just doesn't make any sense. It's impossible to do your work and do it properly. So what has the ER done? It's, it's, uh, it, or it's, in, it not into, it's not an intuitive system, right? So while it has all of the info that's out there, it's difficult to access. So it's turned, it's made ED staff become glorified secretaries. They're chasing doctors back and forth to get uh, diagnoses written on a chart in order to get reimbursement, take care of the patient, patient. Sometimes doctors write things shorthand. They need things written out in the proper language. They need uh, timestamps and codes and stuff. So it, uh, though the information is all there for them, these EMRs are difficult to, to navigate, right? They're very cumbersome. We all know this. So does what is Retrieve DX? We all are, we should be a lot of us familiar with this screen here. This is the Cerner display. We have a mock patient here. We're about to watch Dr. Henry. He's the ED director at Stony Brook University Hospital where R Retrieve was invented. He's going to narrate us through uh, one of these patients here. I'm only going to stop it like one or two times just to point out uh, one or two things that he's doing. But in case I have an issue with stopping because of what happened before, if you just note down here on the bottom left of the Cerner display, there's the comorbidity tab. Dr. Henry's going to uh, click that in a second, and that's going to launch us into the retrieve world where uh, the patient's comorbidities are brought to the doctor's attention. So let's watch Dr. Henry do that and then pick back up. Condition of malignant melanoma. The patient had a trauma, trauma survey done, but there were several comorbidities found. One, so here's Retrieve DX, right? So Retrieve is called the entire patient record, and it's brought forth all the comorbidities pertinent to this, this patient. So it's gone through past and previ uh, previous and current records to identify a chronic anemia for this patient. So merely by hovering over 
the suggested comorbidity chronic, our software provides the doctor with what the rule is below, as you can see, and then what the values are past and present for this patient. So all he has to do is validate that and click it into the record. So let's watch him do a few, and, uh, and then we'll pick up in a second. Note that with one click, it pulls up the latest hemoglobin and hematocrit and previous visit if it was in the electronic record. Suggest chronic, as indeed physician validates. Notes from the height and weight that there's severe malnutrition, a significant comorbid factor. Documents lactic acidosis. SIRS is present, but we don't believe there is a present infection, so we attribute it to non-infectious processes. We note in the record that atelectasis was found uh, in a radiology report. We can go view the entire report and read it in context. And we concur that it is probable atelectasis in the lower lobes and we document it as well. We save to the record, go back into our documentation, find the diagnosis, malignant melanoma, and a subdural hematoma. And to accurately document the findings, we insert the comorbidities. So it's important to note here that these are the comorbidities that Dr. Henry identified when he was in retrieve. And he can still edit these. So it's just, just to answer any questions about HIPAA compliance and things like that. He's validated these, uh, these comorbidities, and here he has an, oppor an opportunity to edit them if he so chooses. So he clicks submit and takes it, uh, puts it into the, uh, the medical record. So what does Retrieve DX do, right? So it finally gives us an opportunity to realize the efficiencies that EMRs promised us years ago. At Stony Brook University Hospital, you had Dr. Mark Henry, ED director, he turned to the CDI director, uh, clinical documentation and in uh, integrity. And she said, Karen, or he said, Karen, we got to stop this back and forth. We need to automate this. We've got the university here. Let's get the computer science department to take this encyclopedia that is the medical record and turn it into a usable research assistant or cliff note, right? So the, these three departments uh, got together and they developed our program which identifies all of a patient's comorbidities in one screen and it adds it into the record in the proper coding language. So after five years at Stony Brook University Hospital, what did they find? We have uh, white papers written by the inventors to back all this up. They found that they were able to reduce the average time of document comorbidities from nine minutes down to seconds, as you could see from the video, right? He didn't have to go and navigate through screens. He didn't have to remember a previous test. It's all right there for him to give the thumbs up for and validate. So by documenting better, obviously reimburse, reimbursement increases. These are good things for the hospital, but most importantly, they improved the observed to expected mortality index. It was cut in half, right? From 1.55 to 0.8. The hospital's leapfrog scores went from an F to a B. Now, since our software uh, was implemented at Stony Brook University Hospital, uh, their CMI has jumped from 1.6 to 2.1. And at Stony Brook, they'll tell you that the, uh, the 0.1 of a CMI is worth $10 million. So that's to the tune of $50 million that we've made or Retrieve has made Stony Brook University Hospital. Another sort of ancil ancillary benefit was that they were able to eliminate two full-time so full CDI specialists. Now at Stony Brook, that really meant that they redistributed them somewhere else, but it was nice to be able to take those people out of the, you know, culling through medical records on a daily basis. So here's our timeline. So what happened? Back in 2015, Retrieve DX was installed, developed, started use at Stony Brook University Hospital. Now, from then to now, they've made the tune of $50 million. This is an increased reimbursement, CMI, their leapfrog scores went out, went up, all sorts of stuff. So in 2019, uh, Retrieve Medical was formed, right? We licensed the software from uh, Stony Brook. At the same time, we started protecting our, uh, our IP. So we filed uh, patents and we have four issued copyrights. Also at that time, we brought on uh, one of our more esteemed members of our team, uh, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. He is the uh, chairman emeritus of 
St. Joe's in Patterson, New Jersey, which is the third busiest ER in the country. But most notably, he's the current president of ASEP, the American College of Emergency Physicians, 40,000 members. It's just about one of the most famous emergency docs in the country right now. So he's our chairman. And, uh, and as far as the te technology development, what we had to do when we licensed it from the on-premise version that was at Stony Brook, we had to write it to the cloud. So that took us a lot of time because they use the uh, computer science department. There are a lot of uh, technicians working on it. So there were a lot of what they call fingerprints, right? So we hired a man to, uh, who's one of our employees to work with the old software to write it on the cloud. So we, we completed that in 2021. And that enabled us to then plug into the major EMRs. So we went about the process of getting certified on Epic and Cerner. So at the beginning of this call, I said it's an exciting time for our company. And that is because six days ago, we completed our Cerner validation. So that's obviously something we were pushing for, very big deal for us. And in tandem with that Cerner validation, we did our Epic validation. So that's to follow very soon. Certainly don't anticipate any issues. Uh, so we're obviously very much looking forward to that. But what's on the end, other end of that rainbow? We got to have a pipeline. So through this time, since we uh, licensed this product in 2019 to now, we've developed a lot of strategic partners, right? So uh, we are very close with University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. They're an epic shop. They're going to be our first epic install. So uh, we have a weekly call with them and their tech team discussing you know, once we get on our uh, validated, how we're going to install, how we're going to implement all that sort of stuff. So uh, we have signed an agreement with them. They're going to be our first Epic install. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we've also signed a partnership with Concord Medical. Concord is a uh, rural hospital system. Uh, they have 70 plus hospitals throughout the Midwest. Uh, and their intentions are to implement it uh, system-wide, and they've already given us two uh, pilot hospitals, we'll call them, and they're both Cerner shops, so we expect to be signing, on, signing up with those two immediately, right? Uh, another one of our uh, important partners is St. Joseph's Medical Center in Yonkers, New York. Uh, they're going to be another one of our Cerner installs. Uh, also along the way, I don't know if anybody's familiar with D2I. They've got over 300 hospital clients. They're a data analytics company, as well as developing a dashboard for our software so that you can monitor, track all of the, uh, you know, in, uh, added uh, CC and MCCs, comorbidity, major comorbidities uh, and whatnot. They're, they're actively uh, marketing us to their, their hospital clients. So that's happening on a daily basis. So that's happening beginning 2022, we're gonna be in these hospitals, but what happens even beyond that, right? So we have uh, mapping for certain contain containers, we're calling them. So if you, you know, more or less understand what we were doing uh, with Retrieve, uh, there's uh, geriatric emergency departments all throughout the country. There's 250 of them. For every ger geriatric patient that comes through an emergency room, they have to undergo five certain tests, falls, risk assessment, all sorts of things like this. So this is an example of a container we would develop that when a doctor hits the retrieve button, they would know the results of those five tests. They wouldn't have to go back and find them, right? I mean, congratulations, not only um, with the Cerner that just happened, but it sounds like Epic is going to happen in the next few weeks, which is super exciting. And your data is amazing. So I want to start with one question for you, and then um, we'll move into our networking session so folks can ask whatever other questions that they have for you then. But tell me, so your results from Stony Brook not only have benefits for providers, which improves efficiency, but patients Definitely um, those improvements in mortality uh, scores is super exciting. And then the hospital's bottom line, of course. How do we know that those results that you saw at Stony Brook are going to be able to be replicated across other hospital systems? There's no doubt about it that we're, by using our process here, we're going to be reducing the time that it takes to document. Uh, so whether you're a large hospital or a sm small hospital, it's not going to change the fact that you've got to navigate through the EMR in order to use or to document properly. So there's, there's no real uh, question of whether or not we're going to save the doctor 
time and energy and stress. Uh, but at the very least, we expect sure. that Retrieve would, I mean, we, we think that it would draw a hospital up to the top 80, the top percentile, 80th percentile of uh, comorbidity, major comorbidity capture rate. But at the very least, we can bring every hospital up to the national average, and that's uh, uh, of comorbidity capture rate, right? So that that will improve the bottom line for every single hospital out there. So um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Please join us in the networking session, and we look forward to continuing the conversation.